Attention all operators on countdown one. We are going to start our go no go poll for today's flight. Raptor one. Go. Raptor two. Go. Stage one. Go. Good morning. On your screen is Starship as it awaits our first ever integrated flight test from Starbase Texas. Flight directors go for flight. 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, ignition. My privilege today to live host this live stream chat with Elon Musk, who's chairman, CEO, founder, and chief technology officer at SpaceX. Elon is also the winner of this year's prestigious IAF World Space Award that recognizes his exceptional impact on the progress of world space activities through his outstanding contributions in space technology and space management. Welcome, Elon. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Yeah. Elon, I don't know if you can see, we have a huge packed auditorium here uh, in Baku uh, with a huge also live audience. Uh, we're streaming this on X and on the IAF uh, web app. So thank you for joining us today. Let's Great. talk rockets. Absolutely. <laughs> All right. Let's talk really big rockets. Okay. Let me take you guys back in time a little bit. <laughs> 15 years ago, I think it was a week past, SpaceX successfully on its fourth attempt launched the Falcon 1 to space to orbit. And I think it carried, if I'm correct, 165 kilogram payload. Today, uh, you're, yes, it, oh, go ahead. It, it, was, it was just a, a test payload uh, on the fourth launch, so no actual satellite, um, because the first three launches unfortunately had failed. So we didn't want to risk the fourth launch with, with an actual satellite. Um, but uh, we're very happy to have launched a Malaysian satellite on the fifth launch uh, of Falcon 1. Yeah. Fantastic. So let me make the contrast. Today, you're preparing for the second launch of Starship, which has the ability, yes. to, uh, ability to launch up to, up to 150 metric tons in a reusable configuration. If I'm doing the math, yeah. and you're better than this at me, 900 times the capability, roughly, of Falcon 1? Am uh, I getting <laughs> Yes. Uh, Falcon 1 looks like a child's toy by comparison. <laughs> it's, uh, it's a staggering achievement, what you've done in 15 years, and all the team at SpaceX, I think we're all just in awe uh, of how fast that progress has been made, and to pioneer reusability uh, for orbital launch systems is, uh, I think, something to be tremendously proud of, both for you and the team there. Um, it stands, this vehicle now, I think something like almost 400 feet tall, roughly over 120 meters. Uh, it's a massive Starship spacecraft and super heavy rocket itself, collectively known as Starship. 
and it produces more thrust than the SLS system, the Saturn V, and uh, Russia's old N1 rocket. Is that correct? Uh, yes. The, the current version of the, of the Starship uh, produces just over twice the thrust of Saturn V. And um, with the upgrades they have, we have in the works, it'll do uh, about three times the, the thrust. So Saturn V in, in the sort of um, old Imperial system would have been seven and a half million pounds of thrust. Uh, we're, we're, we're at about 16 right now. Um, and we, um, with, with future en engine upgrades, we'll take that to about 20 million pounds of thrust. Amazing. Um, yeah. Simply amazing. So I know you guys have said you learned a lot from the April 17th from this first launch attempt. There's been some upgrades to the vehicle. I think it's, it's a Booster 9 now that you're launching with uh, Ship 25. Is that correct? Geeking out uh, on the yes. numbers. Yeah, the kids that follow online. <laughs> uh, these numbers are, are uh, maybe a little... Um, no, no, not, it's not quite the 25th boost booster because uh, what would happen is we would redesign the, we would make a new design and then uh, we'd actually scrap uh, units that were in progress. Um, so it's, it's um, 25 is perhaps, it's, it sounds like we built 25 units, but we haven't actually built 25 units. We built probably about 12. Um, it's a lot. Um, and um, yeah, so, so but the way you think of it really is that this is, this is a flight two. Um, and uh, has a number of upgrades on both the ship side and the booster side. Um, we've done a lot more for, uh, with, with, with engine isolation, which is incredibly important. Um, we've tried to draw as many lessons as possible from the Soviet N1 rocket, which was, is probably the closest in design to the Starship. Um, I believe it had 29 um, NK-33 engines, if I recall correctly. Um, and, um, there was a very quite a high thrust uh, ro rocket, uh, and they unfortunately, they, I, I think actually that rocket, on, on all things considered, was was a great design, um, but uh, did not receive sufficient ground testing, so never never made it to orbit. Um, but that would have been the sort of the closest, probably parallel to to uh, Starship. Um, the, 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 the really the biggest difference, the most fundamental difference of Starship is that it is designed to be fully reusable. Uh, with both the booster and the ship, or the, the both the first and second stage, uh, being uh, are designed to be fully uh, and rapidly reusable. So that so for a, a truly profound revolution in mass to orbit, uh, you have to have uh, I call it <laughs> uh, the, the four the four R's: rap rapidly reusable, reliable rockets. <laughs> R R R R. I love like it. Like a pirate. <laughs> arr, arr, everybody give me an R. Arr, arr, arr. Yeah, arr. All right. So what, is, what does success look like for this uh, flight number two? What does success look like for you? What are you trying to achieve? Um, well, I, I, I do want to set expectations um, well, n not too high. Um, so there's, 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 there's a tremendous amount of new technology in this rocket. Um, we, are, we, we have actually sh changed the entire stage separation system from... Um, uh, something that was, uh, I'm not sure how to describe this, but, 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 um, it, it, it kind of a, 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 a just, just a, a rotation and flip. We're trying, we're trying to, we're trying to move to a passive stage step system where you don't have pushers essentially, um, in, in the, to try to eliminate parts. Um, there's no pushers, no interstage like Falcon 9 has. Um, and, uh, with 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 flight two, we're actually trying to do um, hot staging. Um, so, with, so hot staging would would mean that we uh, light the the ship or upper stage engines uh, while the boost engines are still partially thrusting. So we throttle down and shut down uh, most of the booster engines. Then we light the uh, the ship engines, and there's there's a vent area which looks comically small, um, actually. <laughs> Um, which hopefully is enough, uh, because you're, you're, you're essentially blasting the top of the booster with the ship. Um, uh, now, this is actually, uh, from a physics standpoint, the most efficient way to do stage separation, and the Soviets uh, and, and later the Russians uh, made um, extensive use of, um, of hot staging. Um, and, but, but, of course, uh, this is the first time we're doing it, so... I would say that's that's the riskiest part of the flight uh, for flight two, um, and if 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 the if the engines light and the ship 
it doesn't blow itself up during stage step, uh, then I think we've got a, a decent chance of reaching orbit. Um, now, now it, it, technically, it's it's a it's a scooch below orbit because it's it's going to do almost a complete circle of the Earth, but then splash down somewhere in the, somewhere in the Pacific, uh, just off the coast of Hawaii, um, because the, the ship is designed to re-enter um, and has a has a heat shield. So we, we, we want to make, now we, we don't know if this, we think it'll work, but we aren't sure if it'll work. So if it doesn't work, we want it to not work over the Pacific, which is a very large body of water um, with almost no people on it. <laughs> so. Excellent target, excellent target. Yeah, exactly. I, I mean, I always think it's funny that you know, people call Earth Earth because Earth is water. Um, <laughs> Earth is 70% water. <laughs> And if you take a, 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 a you know, um, a, the, the a, a, an actual round version of the Earth, not not a Mercator projection, um, but at, at the globe, and you center it on the Pacific, it just looks like water. It's 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 like where's the land? <laughs> so anyway, this is, this, is, this is quite helpful when when you're do, doing experimental rocket flights. So how many more test flights are coming up, and when do you think you're going to try to catch Starship on a tower? With, the, with our giant Mechazilla? Yes. <laughs> giant Mechazilla. <laughs> um, listen, I saw Kong versus Godzilla, and that's what gave, get what gave me the idea. <laughs> uh, in fact, if, if we gave our tower legs, it could just tromp around like, like Mechazilla. Um, but but we, have, we, we have a giant um, custom-designed tower with massive mechanical arms that will literally try to catch the booster and catch the ship. Um, which it sounds insane. I mean, I haven't even seen a sci-fi movie that does this, you know. Um, but in theory, it should work. It's, it, it work. Let's just say success is in the set of possible outcomes. Um, and let's say, I'm not sure what the probability is, but success is somewhere in that. Is, is success possible? Yes, I think it's possible. Um, in terms of catching it, I think, um, well, well, for the on, for the ship side, we, we obviously want to make sure that it actually comes in fully intact and, and lands at a precise location in the Pacific before uh, we try to catch it uh, at, at the, the launch site. Because we, 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 we're, we're taking every proportion we can uh, for, uh, so that we do not risk uh, any, any human lives uh, or, or destruction of property. So uh, it'll be a few flights. So, so for the ship, it'll be when, when we see the ship landing at a precise position in the, in the water, uh, that's when we'll uh, try to catch the ship with our Mechazilla on the tower. Uh, the booster, obviously, booster flights we've, we've done many times on Falcon 9, so we're much more familiar and have a much higher confidence uh, with booster recovery. Um, we, we've actually had the booster boost back to land and, and land at uh, Cape Canaveral Air Force Base um, many times, uh, so, albeit with landing legs, not with the Mechazilla arms. Um, so booster, I, 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 but I, I think I think that there's a decent chance, depending on when our licenses are granted, that we would catch the booster within the next uh, year or maybe less than a year, and, and then hopefully, uh, if, if we get lucky, we might catch the ship um, towards the end of next year. And where does the catch take place? Is it Willie Mays in the middle of the outfield over his shoulder, or is it Florida somewhere? Uh, no, it's a, the, 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 both the booster and the ship come back to the launch site. Okay, fantastic. Yeah, that, that's what I mean by the, 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 this, this. In fact, um, I mean, the, the, the thing that, is, since, since we need a giant tower with customized uh, arms to lift the, the booster and the ship onto the launch pad, um, we don't absolutely need it. We can technically do it with, with, with humongous cranes on a low wind day. Um, uh, but that's uh, quite unwieldy. Um, the, 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 the tower with the arms is capable of lifting the booster and the ship even on, 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 a, on, on a very windy day, or oh, moder moderately windy day. Um, so then it, it just seems to me that, well, if we can lift the, the, the ship and the booster, the, the ship onto the, onto the launch stand, or the, the booster onto the launch stand and the ship onto the booster with those same arms, we should be able to catch the, the, the booster and the ship with those same arms. Um, you know, we've, we've gotten pretty good with with um, 
with, with the thruster based landing. Um, and in fact, we, we can make the we, uh, we can make the the rocket hover in midair. Um, in fact, we were able to do that many years ago. If you look at the old uh, Falcon 9 test videos, uh, which we were called Grasshopper, where, where we'd actually take the Falcon 9 booster and we'd have it just go up and, and hover at 100 meters and then translate over another 100 meters, then translate back and then come back and land. So we were able to do that really over a decade ago. Um, it, it's not obviously very efficient with propellant to have a rocket hover, but it can be done. Um, so that was, I was like, okay, well, let's just have the rocket come back and, you know, hover briefly um, and have the, the, then the arms come together and, and, and catch it. So that's the, that's the general idea is uh, going back to what I was saying with, with it's not, it's not just reusability, it's, it's rapid reusability. Um, uh, and, and it doesn't get more rapid than bring it back to the launch site. And so in principle, the, uh, the, the booster, the booster comes back very fast, by the way. One, one way or another, that booster is coming back to land, or it's, it's going to land fast, because um, with, with the high thrust to weight that we're, we're aiming for, which is sort of on the order of 1.3 to 1.4, uh, the, the, and, and, and a staging ratio, which <clears throat> is currently about uh, three to one in favor of the booster, so propellant to, um, the propellant on booster to propellant on ship is about three to one, on on the current version, but it's trending closer to two to one, on uh, with with future versions, uh, it means that we're we're shifting more and more of the uh, delta v burden to the ship side. Um, that that means the the booster actually uh, uses up its propellant quite quickly, um, and we'll we'll trend towards about a, only about a hundred seconds um, or so of a booster flight. Um, and the booster will immediately flip around, boost back to the launch site and land. And so it, it really, we're talking about the booster being back at the launch site in about four or five minutes, <laughs> which is pretty, pretty wild. I think it's like five, five if, if, you know, if a five minute booster, basically. Um, it's, back, it's, 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 it's landed somehow, whether it's, it's either crashed or it's landed on the, it's been caught by the arms, one of the two. Um, and within five minutes. And... So, so, so then you then it lands back on the launch stand, and uh, you can then refill propellant. The 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 booster, the ship side obviously is going to take a minimum of an hour and a half to get around the planet. Um, something pretty fast, uh, but you go to circle the globe, um, and and obviously that, that depends on what uh, inclination and so what what's your launch azimuth, what's your inclination of the booster as to whether uh, it has a flight. Coming back over the launch site or not? If it, uh, it, 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 it so it's technically possible to do it in a single orbit, depending upon your um, launch uh, inclination. Very good. So, so booster come back in an hour and a half. A uh, ship, ship, sorry, so the ship could come back in about an hour and a half. Any uh, any prediction on when you're going to start deploying satellites uh, with Starship? Yeah, I, th I think we will start deploying. Um, I think there's a good chance we start deploying Starlink V3 satellites uh, next year in roughly roughly a year from now. Um, because we, 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 before we are comp confident that the ship, like I said, the, 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 the hardest part about this, or the part that will take the longest, is, the sh is, is um, solving for ship, safe ship reentry um, and landing. And, but, but before we solve that, we can launch the satellites because in any case with Falcon 9, um, the, the, the upper stage is expendable. So, uh, you know, it's, it's actually fine to start, start launching satellites even before we solve for, for, for ship reusability. That, that, that is the hardest part of the equation. So with, with Falcon 9, we've, we've gotten pretty far with reusability. Um, you know, the, the, the booster... It's now highly unusual for the booster to not come back and land. It's, it's, so it's, it's gotten quite normal for the booster to come back and land. We now have a couple of boosters that are, I've, I've done 17, I think 18 flights at this point. Um, and, um, and, and, and then the fairing is also recovered. So the fairing reusability is also solid. Uh, but, but, but the Falcon 9 design does not allow for a reusability of the upper stage. Um, so... And the Falcon 9, just, it, it, while 
reasonably rapid, if you, especially if you've got a, a return to uh, launch site landing. Still takes at least a few days to refurbish before you can fly it again. And so with with uh, with Starship, um, actually more profound than the size uh, is the fact that it is fully it is designed to be fully and rapidly reusable. Um, the, the reason for the absurd size is that we are trying to build something that is capable of uh, have, of creating a permanent base on the moon um, and a city on Mars. That's that's why it is so large. Otherwise, we could make it much smaller. So I think the the diameter of Starship uh, in inside the envelope is something like nine meters, and inside the the top yeah. envelope is about seventeen seventeen and a half meters of usable volume. This is an incredible amount of of space, right? An unheard of uh, volume. What does that what does that open up the possibilities? What what kind of things can we we fit in that space? Uh, what does it mean uh, for the industry as we look ahead? At, you know, maybe you can give me a how many whales or how many starlings can you stuff in there? I don't, huh. I don't know what the right metric is, but give us a sense of size. Well, I mean, like when you, when you step into the, uh, the, the Starship um, bearing or payload volume, it, it looks like a cathedral. It's, it looks absurd, frankly. It's like, why wow, this is ridiculously gigantic. That's, that was my first impression when I, when I first went up there in a man lift and, 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 and climbed through the little hole uh, for the Starship initial rough prototype, I was like, "This, <laughs> like, what, what have we done? <laughs> this thing is too. This thing is ridiculously big." <laughs> um, so now, now, this actually can be great for science, though. Um, so, um, one of the exciting projects that we're working with is uh, with the Sol uh, Pearl Motor at, at Berkeley uh, on a. Um, a telescope, a space telescope, uh, that is able to uh, use the that that what, what you, that you need, it's, it's it's got an enormous lens. I think it's perhaps a seven or eight meter diameter um, lens, and uh, it, it, it's actually a satellite that was meant for the or, or a, a um, the lens was meant for for a ground based satellite. But if you then take that same satellite and put it in um, in in orbit. Uh, its capabilities are greatly enhanced because you don't have the obfuscation of the of the atmosphere. Um, so that, that's why, for example, the 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 Hubble, which is actually a fairly small telescope, can do better than uh, or, or I think any ground, any, any maybe any historical ground satellite, especially in the visual spectrum. So, uh, so, so we're very excited about the, what, what it can do for space science. Um, because, because really at this point, especially for, for any photons that where there's interference with uh, the atmosphere, um, so any, any sort of short wavelength photons, you really want your satellite uh, to be uh, in vacuum, or your, your, your telescope to be in vacuum. Yeah. Um, so that's really the future. So I think there's a lot of exciting potential there for planetary, uh, for, for space science. Um, and, um, but, but like I said, the, the, the really fundamentally, the reason it's so, so gigantic is is that uh, if, if you're on a you know long journey to Mars, I think being cooped up in a something the size of a minivan would would uh, be unappealing to most people. Just so comparison <laughs> for the audience here, I think the Hubble telescope was something like 2.4 meter diameter, yeah. uh, and so you're talking about I think three times the size uh, somewhere along that order for the Mir. That's incredible. Um, We've seen some changes down there in Texas at Starbase. I don't know if that's where you're, you're, you're uh, streaming from here today, but uh, there's a new factory uh, that you're working on to enable a faster manufacturing rate. Can you talk to us a little bit about that? What are you trying to, what are your goals? What are you, what are you trying to achieve with the, with the new factory? Yeah, so we are building a giant factory for a giant rocket. Um, and um, I mean, honestly, it, it, I, I recommend people visit uh, Starbase. Um, as it turns out, it's, it's on a state highway. So for the, I think it's one of the rare situations where, uh, and I actually don't mind, I think it's kind of cool, that the, that the public can actually drive within a literal stone's throw away from the factory and the launch site and actually see the rocket firsthand. And in fact, uh, if you go on the internet right now, including on the X platform, there are people who are live streaming at 24 seven, uh, the entire construction, uh, launch pad, everything. Um, and um, so, so it's, it's, people say like, well, can, can I go see it? It's so easy to go see. You can just literally fly to Brownsville 
and drive down, drive to the beach, and you can see it literally a stone's throw away, the factory and the launch site. Um, so anyone who wants to do that, I, I recommend it. It's very, very easy. <laughs> no permission required. Um, so yeah, we're, we're building this giant rocket factory. Um, we, the engines are still manufactured in California at SpaceX uh, headquarters uh, in, um, in in Los Angeles, um, which, which is also that's it's also an odd location. That's where we built the the, the, the uh, Falcon 9 rockets and the Dragon spacecraft, really about five minutes from LAX, um, at the at sort of what used to be a Northrop headquarters, I believe. Um, so, um, so that's so anyway, that, that's but yeah, we're, we're building this, this giant factory. So. <clears throat> The thing is, so in order to, um, if, if you look at the, in the grand scheme of things, say, okay, what is required to have a self-sustaining base on Mars or, or city on Mars? Um, you have to really think of it in, in terms of very large tonnage. Uh, the, and, and if we can even get the tonnage estimate to correct to within an order of magnitude, I think we'd be doing well. Um, so the, you know, I think, I think we, we should probably aim for something like a million tons of useful load delivered to the surface of Mars, um, which requires roughly 5 million tons to Earth orbit. So, you know, because you get about 20, for whatever mass you get to Earth orbit, you get about 20% of that mass landed to the surface of Mars. You know, give or take, maybe you can get 25% optimistically. Um, so th that's why this thing is so gigantic, um, is we've got to get 5 million tons to, to, to Earth to orbit, which hopefully gets about um, a million tons to the surface of Mars, and hopefully a million tons is enough to create a self-sustaining city on Mars. Un incredible. Uh, so talking about Mars, any new predictions on when you, I know this is your ultimate goal, your destination. Uh, any predictions on when Starship might land on Mars without crew, maybe a crewed flight? Any, uh, any prediction there? Well, hmm. I think three or four years. Four years. That would yeah, be... something like. All right. Um, I have to check with the Earth Mars. Uh, you know, Earth and Mars. Uh, the you know um, get, get have orbital synchronization about every twenty six months. Um, so you can't just go you fly to Mars when it's on the other side of the sun um, from Earth. Uh, that's uh, unwieldy. So the, roughly every twenty six months, the orbits. Um, uh, are in the, the right relative position, um, and then you then you have the Mars transport window. Um, so I, I think you know, but I think it's sort of feasible within the next four years um, to do an uncrewed test test landing there. Yeah. Didn't have enough on your plate. You're doing a lunar lander version, yes? Yeah. Well, really, Starship should be a generalized. Uh, transport system to anywhere in the solar system. That, that's the intent with, when you, when you have propulsive landing, you, you, it, you, you can land anywhere, whether there's an atmosphere, no atmosphere. Um, you know, it, it's not really dependent on uh, water. Uh, you know, obviously, if, you know, for, for uh, crude capsules on, on, on Earth, we've generally gone with parachutes and water. Um, or, you know, uh, and in Russia, it's on, on land, but then they need retro rockets right at the, at the end to sort of slow things down. Um, so it, a, a propulsive system uh, should generalize to be able to land anywhere on a solid surface, anywhere on the, 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 um, in the solar system. So um, the, the, the moon, while it's sort of dusty, that, that, that the moon is actually hotter than it's, it's not just a big dust pile, so it's it's hotter than you'd think. Uh, the, the the lunar regolith. Um, so I'm I'm sort of optimistic that we can take a starship that's fairly, you know, unmodified from what would land on Earth or Mars. Obviously, you need legs, um, but apart from that, I suspect you could land the starship with minor modifications on on the moon, and and the same would go for once you have a propellant uh, plant on Mars, um, you could then go to the asteroid belts and, and the moons of Jupiter. Um, if you can establish a propellant plant there, um, then, um, then you could go to uh, the moons of Saturn and, and ultimately all the way out into the Kuiper belt and uh, Earth cloud. 
what you're talking about requires propellant transfer, obviously, in orbit. Can you explain to everyone uh, uh, watching why that's necessary and how it works and, and how you work to progress to, to make that propellant transfer happen? Uh, yes, yeah, so r really propellant transfer is, is a similar problem to just docking. Um, now, we, we've gotten pretty good at docking with the uh, Dragon going to the space station. Um, and docking with the space station is uh, really quite difficult because it, uh, we didn't design the space station and the space station has a lot of complexities uh, and has crew on board. So uh, what we have to be extremely careful um, and that the so docking with the space station takes, is, is like, I would say it's far more difficult to dock with the space station than it would be to dock with our own spaceship. Um, and, and so uh, propellant transfer just really means um, that we we send a a, a starship up there with with no payload, um, and and it just transfers its propellant to um, a ship that is already there. So you have to dock, dock with the ship that is going to Mars uh, or the Moon, and transfer the propellant um, from a version of the ship that has no cargo. Now there's there's, there's there'll be a future sort of um, tanker optimized version of of starship. Um, where where we, you know, get, um, ha have have str so we we stretch the tanks, um, and have little to no cargo space, uh, because that's the optimal thing for a tanker. But but you don't have to do that. Um, that will that will increase the, pro the the propellant load of the tanker, or you know the, pro the propellant transferability of the of the of the tanker. But it's not it's not absolutely necessary. You could just you could in theory use an unmodified starship, uh, and transfer propellant that way. So um, I, I would imagine that you're doing this and you may have multiple launches uh, in either rapid succession or maybe multiple pads launching multiple versions of the vehicle. Is that all taking place from Texas? And how quickly do those launches have to take place to make this uh, work? Yeah, we, we'll, we'll have a launch site in, in Texas as well as in Florida. So we, we've actually partially built a Starship launch pad um, at... Uh, had 39A, which is where we launched uh, Falcon Heavy and um, our crewed, uh, crewed, the crewed Dragon. Um, so we've partially built, we, we, and we'll, probably, we'll, we'll fully build that out over time. And, pr and probably have, um, at some point, a, a Greenfield um, location for Starship at, at the Cape. Um, now, in the, in the sort of, you say like four or five year time frame, where perhaps we're launching several times a day, uh, then we may need to go to uh, an ocean-based like platform. Um, just if, if if you're launching, I don't know, ten times a day, uh, that might be a bit much for even for, even for the Cape. I don't know. Um, but uh, we, so we may end up doing uh, platform-based launches um, from from uh, from a specially designed sort of ocean-going platform. Um, but we, we, we will need to do a lot of launches. I mean, we're talking about thousands of launches per year. So, uh, at, at, and, and so the, you, you do get up to the sort of what I was talking about, um, million tons or five million tons to orbit, that if you've got, you know, a uh, thousand launches a year, each of which do over a hundred tons, that's a hundred thousand tons of a, a cargo, you know, per, per year to orbit. Um, there's still not quite enough. Um, I think we'd want to get to roughly a million tons of orbit uh, per, per year, uh, to, to Earth, Earth orbit per year, which would mean that you get to a million tons to Mars in five years. Now, th these are very big numbers, obviously. Um, to just put things into perspective, uh, all of Earth launch capability uh, right now, it, apart from Falcon, is about 400 tons to orbit per year. Um, Falcon 9 uh, this year will do, I think, around 15 or 1,600 tons. So Falcon 9, you know, it's already doing about 80% of Earth mass to orbit. Uh, and next year, we expect to increase that by about 40 or 50% on the Falcon side. So, you know, um, maybe 2,500 tons to orbit for Falcon next year. But these are small, still small numbers compared to what's required for um, essentially making life multiplanetary. 
well, making like multi oh, okay. you've got to be in the sort of hundreds of thousands to millions of tons of to, to earth orbit per year. Unbelievable numbers, really. Uh, as somebody worked in the launch business for several years, it's uh, it's incredible for me to even try to think about that much mass to orbit in one year. It's uh, it's, That's crazy. Yeah, it's absolutely crazy. Ludicrous mode, I think, yeah, for launch. Very much so. Yeah. But, but it, it's, it's, it, it's, it's either, either we do that or we're a single plant species forever. So we, we, we either achieve uh, those kind of numbers or um, we, will, we will never have a self-sustaining city on Mars. To building this amazing launch system, you're also uh, working on a Polaris mission uh, for that's going to allow, I think, Dragon to open and have uh, people uh, uh, actually floating in space, uh, doing an EVA. And you're building a spacesuit for that. Um, so you can talk to us a little bit about that spacesuit, and can you use that same suit on the Moon and Mars and for other missions? Yeah. So the SpaceX uh, spacesuit. Um, we, we do expect to evolve that to be something that can be an EVA suit on uh, the ground on the Moon and Mars. Um, um, and um, it started off initially as, as really just a pressure suit, just in case there's an emergency, emergency depressurization of the spacecraft. Um, so it's, it's, it was basically like a self-contained life support system uh, in, in suit form. Um, and uh, obviously it will re re retain that capability, but uh, but but now um, for, for an upcoming flight, we we want to, to do an EVA or extra vehicle. You know, basically go float around in space, um, still on a tether. So it's not it's not going to be an independent uh, little little space little spacesuit that's just flying around. Um, we could do that, but and maybe that'll happen on a future flight. Uh, but it will be a tethered uh, EVA. Um, so you're just you're just out there floating in the void, connected by a thin cord to the spaceship. Amazing. Uh, you uh, put a Tesla in space. This was like an amazing uh, thing to see a Tesla actually flying into space. So you've already put yeah. put one of the vehicles in space. Are you thinking about yeah. making a Tesla rover, uh, maybe Moon or Mars? Uh, any any ideas for a Cybertruck on the Moon? It would look cool. That's for sure. Um, now the, nice thing, the nice thing about electric cars is that obviously do not require oxygen to, uh, they're not combustion cars, so they don't, they don't require, they don't have to ingest oxygen from the uh, ambient atmosphere. Um, so, um, yeah, I think you know, Tesla could easily make a car that, uh, you know, like a Cybertruck lunar variant, <laughs> just get, get the, get the moon option package. Um, so, um, yeah, I mean, the, the, the reason that we launched the car the reason we launched the car with Falcon Heavy, I should say, is it's that uh, we wanted to have something was that was exciting as a uh, initial payload, but but where the loss of the payload would not be catastrophic. So people wonder what, why is my why is my car orbiting Earth and Mars? Because um, it, it's it's in an elliptical orbit. Um, and, and actually, it almost touches, it touches like the edge of the asteroid belt and, and goes past the orbit of Mars. It's just that we, 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 were, we weren't sure if the first flight of Heavy would fail or not. And we wanted to just have a payload that was more exciting than a punk. I thought it was brilliant, uh, really, uh, a masterstroke in terms of getting uh, attention of the world, really, to put that in orbit. Thanks. Uh, can Starship be used as a space station? How long could it stay in orbit, and uh, what, what would be the purpose of that? How, how could that work? So how long could Starship be in orbit? Yeah, could it be its own oh. space station? If you wanted to put a Starship oh, yeah, up yeah, with yeah. a capability, a laboratory, how long could, that, uh, could, st could it stay in orbit and still come down? Oh, uh, there's no real limit. It could stay in orbit for a very long time. Um, the... the, the uh, the volume of the Starship fairing is roughly comparable to the volume of the of the International Space Station. Um, so there's about a, about a thousand cubic meters of, of volume in the in the uh, fairing. And I think I think space stations are a comparable amount. Yeah. And would have the power to so run a lot of laboratory experiments. Sorry. Yeah. 
given that it's given that it's a similar volume to the space station, um, you you could uh, do what what you're doing in the space station on a starship uh, if you want. Um, but there's no there's no limit to how long it can stay out, stay up there. It's really just you 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 need you know solar panels, battery, and um, uh, some thrusters to maintain orbit. How about point-to-point -point transportation? I know uh, when you were in Guadalajara uh, at the IEC, uh, you got you kind of hinted at a little bit of the point-to-point point -point capability of transportation. Uh, I, I can't remember the exact amount of time to get from one side of the world to the next, but can you talk about that? How do you see the, the future of point-to-point -point using, uh, using Starship? Yeah, so... Uh, the, the fastest way with, with known physics to get from one place to another on Earth is with an intercont intercontinental ballistic missile. Um, this, is, this is why ICBMs with nukes are kind of like the ultimate weapon. Um, now, in this case, it's sort of lead the nuke at landing. Um, but it's, it's, it's certainly very feasible. Um, obviously, if we can uh, take off and transfer and land on Mars or the moon, we can take off and land on Earth, too. Um, so, so it really comes down to a question of, of is it economically viable compared to long distance aircraft? And I think our, our back of the envelope numbers suggest that it, it actually has a shot at being economically viable for long distance transport on Earth um, for, for a few reasons. Um, the, the propellant cost is actually quite low, being um, uh, liquid methane, liquid oxygen. Uh, the, the cost of liquid oxygen, it's, it's primarily liquid production. It's about um, 77, 78% uh, liquid oxygen by, by mass and roughly 22 or 23% um, liquid methane. So the propellant cost is quite, it's, the, it's the lowest cost propellant you could possibly um, get on Earth. And, um, and then the, um, the, because the rocket's moving so fast, uh, you, you can use it about in theory, about ten times more than you could use an aircraft. So, um, you know, so, so Falcon 9, oh, sorry, a Starship can go from, let's say, Los Angeles to Sydney or something like that um, in uh, 20 minutes, basically, maybe half an hour at most. So, um, you know, whereas I think I think an airliner takes about 14 or 15 hours. So you've got something which is really much faster than an aircraft. And so for an airliner that you can do basically an order of magnitude more trips with Starship than you can with an airliner, which means that the, and, there's, and the, no, no pilots are needed. In fact, you can't, pilot, this is not, only a computer can pilot this because human reaction times are not fast enough. Um, so then you don't have the pilot costs, you don't have the food costs, you don't have the, um, you, you know, you don't really even need bathrooms if we can get there in half an hour. So it actually would work out that uh, it's it's actually we think lower cost than long distance aircraft. Okay, you got a little chuckle here in the crowd about the no bathroom line. So I think people are looking forward to it. Yeah, I mean, it's less than a half an hour. You know, you say like go, just go before you hop on. You know, <laughs> and. Um, yeah, it'll be there fast. I mean, you, you could technically, um, you know, um, have, I don't know, bre breakfast in L.A., uh, lunch in London, and, you know, dinner in Singapore, and then be back, back in L.A. for bedtime. All right, you heard it here, guys. Huge, huge round of applause here. Cool. So you're connecting now, I think, something like 2 million people with Starlink, right, with your, with your satellite communication system uh, and growing rapidly. Um, you're mastering communications from space to Earth, uh, from low Earth orbit. You're now doing uh, inter-satellite links uh, with this system. Uh, what do you see for Starlink being used as a relay, let's say, around the moon, or for COM relay all the way to Mars and back? Yeah. Um... Well, for for Mars, Mars, you'd want um, 
basically uh, like a laser relay system. Essentially, it sort of depends on what you, what 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 bandwidth are you looking for. Obviously, if, if, in order to have continuous coverage uh, with Mars, you, you'd have to um, uh, have some relay system because what, you, you can't transmit through the sun. So when Mars is on, the, you know, when the sun is between you and the and Mars, you have to um, do a bank shot um, through a relay satellite um, so that your photons don't have to go through the sun. Um, uh, so and and then it, ha, ha, you have to say, well, ultimately we would want, you know, terabit, maybe petabit level data transfer between Earth and Mars. So then you're gonna you're gonna want probably some some relay satellites along the way to be able to do that. Um, it's just it's really it's a bandwidth thing. Um, you, you'd want to use lasers. Um, and then the, the, the laser beam is going to widen um, with distance so that then you need to be able to receive the laser beam before it gets too wide. Um, this means that you need a series of satellites uh, in order to um, communicate with Mars at, at its furthest distance, especially uh, with very high bandwidth. Well, you can obviously do low bandwidth uh, with longer wavelength length photons, but, but, but if, if there's a you know, human city on Mars, uh, You'd want to have very high bandwidth, so then for a bunch of lasers. Uh, and, and satellite, Starlink already uses inter, uh, lasers for intersatellite communication. So if, if I may, just a couple more questions. Um, throughout this week here at the IC, uh, yeah. we've been inspired. There's thousands of young people here. I think 41% of our delegates are under the age of 35, which is incredible by, by any uh, space conference metric. We get a lot of young people here. Uh, there's delegates from the Space Generation Advisory Council, from the Future Space Leaders Foundation, from the YP program here at the IAF. Do you have a message for these young people, the young engineers and scientists that are here? Many of them have been inspired by you. Anything you can say to them about pursuing a career in space or what motivated you to do all the things that you're doing? Yeah. Um, I mean, I'm interested in that which further civilization. Um, and I, I think we want to expand the scope and scale of consciousness so as to better understand the nature of the universe. Um, and even to ask, understand which questions to ask. Like, um, you know, one of the most inspiring books I ever read was uh, The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, um, where, where in the, they're, they're trying to understand the meaning of life in the, you know, Hitchhiker's Guide. And the... I mean, the larger message of the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy is that you, you actually need to know what questions to ask about the answer that is the universe. And we, we don't yet know what questions to ask. So I'm just curious, really. I'm just curious as to the nature of reality. Um, where, does, where, where, do, where does it all go to? Where does it, where does it come from? Where, where are the aliens, for example? Are there aliens? Or is it, are we alone? Um, people often ask me um, if I'm seeing any evidence of, of aliens. And... I unfortunately have seen uh, no evidence of aliens yet. We are the aliens, as far as I can tell. Um, and I think if anyone would know, it would probably be me, and I've not seen any evidence of aliens. So what, what that perhaps suggests is that um, the, this tiny candle of consciousness that is humanity uh, is all that exists in a vast darkness. Um, and we should do everything we can to ensure that the candle does not go out. Bound. We've had a wonderful week here in Baku. Uh, by the, yes. So we've had a wonderful week here in Baku. Uh, next year we're going to Milan in Italy for the 75th IAC. We would love to have you come back for sure. If you're in the neighborhood or you can hop over in a starship, we would love to have you. Huh. Sure. Uh, it would be quite the, quite, quite the, quite the entry. It's going to uh, land on the roof. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'll ask the Italian host to see if that's possible. <laughs> so um, just a, a, a fun question to end. When do you think we can host a, an ISC in outer space? Um, that's a great question. Um, I, probably less than 10 years. Let's have it. Well, Elon, I'd like to thank you for joining us today. Congratulations on the World Space Award. Well-deserved. 
and uh, our pleasure. We'd love to have you back. Good luck with your next launch. Thank you. Thanks. It was an honor to be, be interview. Thank you, everyone.